Okay, we've talked about one type of reversible inhibition, the competitive inhibition, and now we're going to talk about the other two types of reversible inhibition, uncompetitive inhibition and the non-competitive. Now let's start with the uncompetitive inhibition. Let's just remind ourselves that the uncompetitive inhibitor is only able to bind to the enzyme substrate complex. It is not able to bind to the free enzyme, but once the substrate binds, this binding pocket forms for the inhibitor. Um, now let's look and see how that uncompetitive inhibitor interacts with our michaelis menten equation and how it changes CAM and Vmax. So if we look at our standard equation that describes an enzyme-catalyzed reaction, we can see that the uncompetitive inhibitor sort of is um, influencing it at the level of the enzyme substrate complex. When the enzyme binds to substrate to form this complex, it can either go on to form product or some of this enzyme substrate complex is bound by the inhibitor to form the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex, which is not productive, no reaction. So I like to think of this uncompetitive inhibitor as sort of siphoning off enzyme substrate complex into this non-productive side pathway. And that obviously has an inhibitory effect, right? Now, this inhibitor, just like the competitive one we saw earlier, can be described, the binding of it to the enzyme substrate complex can be described with a dissociation constant. And the more effective inhibitors have the lower dissociation constant, again reflecting that they spend most of their time bound to the enzyme substrate complex. Now, how does siphoning off this enzyme substrate complex affect KM and Vmax? Well, it does so in a pretty interesting way. Um, if you look at the Lineweaver Burke plot, which you probably now realize is the best way to um, determine KM and Vmax and to observe differences of, in those kinetic values in the presence of an inhibitor, you'll see that the lines uh, for an uncompetitive inhibitor, they sort of do the opposite thing of what we saw with a competitive inhibitor. If we look back to the competitive inhibitor, we showed that this slope of the lines change, reflecting an increase in KM. However, the Vmax and the y-intercept did not change with the competitive inhibitor. Now, with an uncompetitive inhibitor, it turns out that both the KM and the Vmax decrease. And they do so in a proportional fashion, so that the lines of the inhibited reactions in green and purple um, are altered from the not inhibited line, but they have the same slope. So we end up with a series of parallel lines. And again, you can describe them with alpha values, in this case an alpha prime value, which describes the um, amount of deviation from the uninhibited reaction. Um, and again, that alpha prime value can be used to calculate the dissociation constant for a particular um, inhibitor. Now, it might be obvious if we look back here why Vmax decreases, right? We're obviously not going to be able to ever reach our maximal velocity because we can't outcompete this inhibitor. It's always going to be siphoning away some of this enzyme substrate complex. And if we add more and more substrate, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't help. Right? It just means that we're going to have most of our enzyme in this enzyme substrate complex. However, we're still going to pull off, siphon off some of that into this non-productive role. Since the inhibitor and the substrate are not competing against each other, then you can't outcompete this inhibitor. So the result of that is you know, the total Vmax for the reaction is going to decrease. Now, why would KM decrease? Usually we think of a decrease in KM as a good thing. We said the lower the KM, the higher the affinity is between the enzyme and the substrate. So KM decreases because really we're removing some enzyme substrate complex from the reaction. And according to Le Chatelier's principle, if we sort of remove one um, product, we're going to shift the reaction to the right. And that means that really we're going to need less substrate in order to reach that weaker maximal velocity that we saw uh, because of the presence of this inhibitor.
So the net result is, you know, we're going to lower the KM, lower the Vmax, and we end up with this parallel line. Now, what about the other type of inhibitor, the non-competitive inhibitor? Now, the non-competitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme, uh, not at the substrate binding site, but at an alternate site. And it doesn't care if it's binding to the enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex. It can bind to either of those things. And so the effect on KM and Vmax is, is pretty complicated, really. Um, if we look at the way that this inhibitor interacts, we can see that it can bind to the free enzyme to form an enzyme inhibitor complex, or it can bind to the enzyme substrate complex and form enzyme substrate inhibitor complex, both of these being you know, non-productive. <clears throat> so the, really, the effects on KM and Vmax are, are varied. Um, and we call this mixed inhibition. And it gets really complicated. We don't need to know how to combine the alpha and alpha prime values. But suffice it to say, if we can bind to the free enzyme and the enzyme substrate complex, we're going to change the slope and we're going to change the y-intercept. Um, and so we get a change in CAM, we get a change in Vmax, and it, we get these, these crazy um, plots that have changes in slope and changes in that y-intercept. Um, and so the non-competitive or mixed inhibitor <clears throat> is, um, you know, is easy to determine because you get changes in both of these things that show very different lines.